right. Uh, I'd like to uh, just thank you for coming out this evening. I guess all of you uh, realize this is uh, our second last uh, lecture in the series, uh, Women in Equality, Why? Uh, tonight, we're especially uh, fortunate to have with us Ms. Silva Gelber, who is uh, the director of the Women's Branch of the Department of Labor, the Women's Bureau. Uh, First of all, this bureau has been in existence for 20 years, and Ms. Gelber has been uh, its director for the last six years. And uh, I'm sure that many of you have uh, heard of all the good work that the bureau has been doing, all the publications that have come out uh, with reference to uh, women in the labor market. Uh, I think that without any further ado, I'll introduce Ms. Galbert to you, and uh, she'll be discussing uh, women and, uh, and their problems on the labor market. Thank you. Very frankly, I'd rather sort of sit on the top on the other side, but I, I know they want the microphones. I thought that perhaps it might be a good idea tonight for us to discuss some of the laws affecting women who work not only in Quebec, which I know has already been discussed or is about to be discussed in your series, but in the context of the whole of the Canadian scene because it won't come as news to you that Canada is perhaps one of the most governed peoples on this earth. We've got all of our various levels of government, each one with certain jurisdictions in the labor area, and having certain jurisdiction, they have certain parallel laws, and they have parallel bureaucracies charged with the enforcement of those laws, and it's all very confusing indeed. To give you an example, I don't know how many of you here are working women, but those of you that are will know that when you're working in an establishment which is subject to deductions from your wages for unemployment insurance, that you're entitled to certain benefits in the event of maternity. Now, many provinces have maternity leave laws which guarantee them their job during that period. Quebec has not yet got that kind of a law, but nevertheless, you do benefit from the unemployment insurance that you are eligible and entitled to receive. The reason is very simple. Your pregnancy benefits under unemployment insurance are under a federal law, and the right to leave, which some provinces give to working women, is under provincial law so that you in Quebec sit in the peculiar circumstance of getting those benefits that come through the federal law but have not yet got in your province the provincial law guaranteeing your rights. Well, let's go back now to the beginning. I merely threw that in to show you what a complicated picture labor law generally is in Canada. And that same complication affects the law relating to working women. How many of you, incidentally, if you just raise your hands, how many of you do work? Good, okay, then we're gonna go on and talk. I, I, I didn't want to talk about labor law and how it affects you if a lot of you weren't working women. We are working then. You've earned it. I want to tell you I'm joining the ranks very soon. Not willingly. Well, let's start from the beginning. The field of employment in Canada 
is divided. Now, that does not parallel other fields, such as health and welfare, where the predominant responsibility rests with the provinces. In the field of employment, with regard to work, there is a special segment of the working industrial world which is under the direct jurisdiction of the federal government, whereas all of the rest of it is the provincial government. So if some of you here are working in banks, if some of you here are working in the airlines, if some of you here work for Bell Telephone, these kinds of work, these kinds of employment come under the federal law. On the other hand, if you work in the department stores, if you work in the small factory, if you work in the schools, if you work in the libraries, unless it's a library in one of these other kind of establishments, and then it might also be federal, but unless it's one of these things, then you're under provincial law. So that it's not very simple to tell you what the situation is in your particular case. I frequently get letters in Ottawa giving me a problem that exists and telling me they work in a textile something or other. Well, that rather indicates to me it's likely to be provincial. But if it were a textile section of Air Canada, which mends something to do with it and so on, then it might be federal. Having said all that, I want you then perhaps to come with me through the various kinds of laws and I'll just mention where there is a federal law and where there is a parallel provincial law because they're not exactly the same. In the federal area of jurisdiction, there were the types of establishments I mentioned regulated by the Canada Labor Code, with which some of you may be familiar. The Canada Labor Code includes two specific sections which relate to women. One section is the right to maternity leave. That is, if you work in a federal undertaking, you have the right in total to 17 weeks of leave during which time you cannot be fired. You have the right to get your job back, either the same job or the job at an equal level. That is tenure of security of job. At the provincial level, there are a number of provinces already that have that kind of a law. British Columbia has, and let me say this, that British Columbia was the first to have such a law, and that goes back over 40 years. Alberta does not have that kind of a law. Saskatchewan does. Manitoba does. Ontario does. Nova Scotia does. New Brunswick does. And Newfoundland does. Prince Edward Island does not. And as yet, Quebec does not. With regard to Payment during that period of leave, I've mentioned to you that that's under the Unemployment Insurance Act, which is federal. And now just to confuse you a little bit more, let me explain to you that the only reason that's federal is that the 
Constitution of Canada was amended in order to make it possible for the federal government to get into that field. Then there are, there is within the Labor Code of Canada the section pertaining to equal pay. Now what equal pay means, and you don't have a law here, so I'm going to explain this a little more fully. Equal pay simply means that if you're at a workbench and a man stands beside you at the same workbench and you're doing the same or similar work and you both have the same or similar skills and there are several other sames that are outlined in the law then the law says you shall be paid the same wage for that work and some of you are going to say well what is the situation in canada are men doing the same or similar work to that that women are doing being paid the same and i can only tell you that my statistics say no it isn't an easy law to administer and also in the early days and we've had those laws in other provinces and at the federal level for many years the laws themselves were worded in such a way that it didn't lend itself to easy implementation for example in the early days of the law which required you to pay the same for the same job the only way the law would come into force was if the woman complaining herself wrote a letter herself to the minister of labor himself complaining and then the wheels could begin to turn well most women in that position were much too fearsome of losing their little job that they needed to complain and also it's rather cumbersome way of doing it and as a result although equal pay laws were on the books starting with i believe it was ontario in 1953 that's over 20 years ago those laws until very recently were gathering dust on the statute books in recent years though there has been a move towards amending them making it possible now for governments themselves to take action and making it possible also for organizations or others to take action on behalf of the worker so that the worker herself was not required to be the one to start the ball rolling some changes have resulted from that I know that in the federal area of jurisdiction there is a very large undertaking with which many of you are familiar where they're going through with a fine comb. They're going through the books, they're examining the records of payment, in, they're comparing it to the style given for the job and they're asking the employer to explain the difference. And the explanation isn't always what the employer would like it to be. And it's not being accepted when it comes out that way. So we're beginning some 20 years after we started putting these kinds of laws on the statute books. We're beginning to see a little move in the implementation of those laws. Now, as I mentioned previously, Quebec does not have a law called an equal pay law. But as, since you've discussed Quebec legislation before, you know that Quebec nevertheless has a law prohibiting discrimination in employment, at least in the lower levels. Equal pay is discrimination. 
Again, though, it was one of the laws that was early on the books. I was, believe it was 1964. I don't know whether it's ever been used. I'm glad to say that there are new laws in the drafting stage now for this province. So you may be finding that you're going to have available to you a tool that might be helpful in this regard. But there's another kind of law I want to discuss with you tonight because in my personal view, it's much more important than this equal pay law. Equal pay law will only apply when your salary or your wage is compared with that of a male colleague. So if you happen to be one of the vast majority of working women working in an occupation where there aren't any men, that law isn't very much use to you anyway because there's nothing to compare it with. You're all women and you're all getting low wages. There's another kind of law, though, that's been growing up in Canada, and it's not far removed from your 1964 law, although it's certainly a much, much stronger type. It's more capable of implementation. It's broader in its interpretation. And that law says very simply, you shall not discriminate on grounds of sex in any condition of employment, period. I interpret that to mean also equal pay. So that if we had these kinds of laws all across the country, forcefully administered, capable of administration and capable of implementation, I don't know that we would even need the equal pay laws because we could use those laws for the same purpose. But history, historically, it was equal pay that was recognized as a principle. 1919, when the International Labor Organization was established, in the constitution of that organization, one of the principles enunciated wasn't equal opportunity for women, it was just equal pay. So you see, we've grown up a bit in the years since that organization was established. The law, the kind of law to which I'm referring, or a law resembling the kind of law to which I'm referring, now exists in British Columbia, in Alberta, in Saskatchewan, in Manitoba, in Ontario. I can count your law in Quebec because with all its faults, it was the first one. In New Brunswick, in Nova Scotia, in Newfoundland, missing still is the province of Prince Edward Island, and I'm sorry to draw your attention to it, but since I'm giving you the list, the federal government. The federal government has promised and is preparing a law which will entail this kind of a principle and if the announced plans are carried out, it will have an advantage over all of the existing provincial laws in one regard. All of these, you can call them fair employment laws if you like, you can call them 
human rights laws. They go under different titles, but as uh, Gertrude Stein once said, a rose is a rose is a rose. I don't care what its name is. If it's that kind of a law, it in, is the law which guarantees no discrimination in any condition of employment. And the federal law, it is, was announced, will be implemented not in the way the equal pay laws are administered and not in the way the other fair employment laws and human rights laws are administered, but in a different way from all of them, in that it is proposed to set up what's called an independent commission. An independent commission is not a department of government. It is a body which is responsible not to the government, but to the whole of parliament, so that the directives which are made to that body come not just from the government in power, but the opposition also has a say because they form an integral part of our legislation, our legislative chamber. So that it may be hoped that we will have available to us a strong law in the federal area, which says quite clearly and equivocably, you shall not discriminate in conditions of employment. Now, what does it mean besides equal pay? Because as I mentioned, I could interpret the old equal pay principle as coming within that concept as well, without a separate law. Well, it means this. It means when you recruit someone for a job and you decide that that's the kind of a job a man's always had and for this reason I won't take the woman who is applying, if the reason is that it's a woman, that will be illegal. If you are working in an establishment and there is a vacancy available and a promotion is to be anticipated. Your qualifications are the best qualifications and yet the job isn't given to you because you're a woman. That will be against the law. If there are training programs, in-service training programs particularly, and women are not considered, as until recently they were not considered in such institutions as banks, for example, then it will be against the law. Now, before we came in here, I was having a discussion with Ms. Kisson, and she was questioning me quite rightly as to the value of law. And she's right. The value of a law depends on a many factors that are lie outside of that law. The value of the law depends on the attitudes of the people administering the law. It depends on the extent to which those affected will make use of the law. It depends on the attitudes of the courts. It depends on a wide variety of conditions that may apply, but a law is a tool and can be used if it's there, and if it's not there, that tool is lacking. 
so that given all of the best circumstances, if you do not have the tool, you have no way of bringing about change rapidly. I look on the law as a clear statement of public policy. And you can ask me how, if it's a clear statement of public policy, the equal pay laws didn't operate. Well, all I can say is it was like tokenism. I don't know how serious the initiators of those laws were when they placed those laws on the statute books. It may be that as a result of international action in this field, it was considered that if you wanted to be progressive, you put some laws onto the statute books. On the other hand, it may be that lack of experience was also not very helpful. But I believe that the time now has come when you, who are working women, are gaining through seminars such as this an understanding of what laws are available, of what tools are there, and the extent to which you can use them. And believe me, I think in the last analysis, the efficacy of those tools depends on you and the extent to which you're ready to use them and the extent to which you're ready to publicize them. I don't know whether many working women were even aware of the existence of laws affecting their work. Ignorance of the law can make that law completely useless. I think we've a changed atmosphere today in Canada. I think that working women have reached a point now where they're not prepared any longer to compromise and to permit themselves to be used as a pool of cheap labor. And I think that governments today are ready. They claim to be ready. We must believe them to give us the tools with which to bring about the change we want to bring about. Now, what I'd like to do, this has all been rather dry, I would like you to start throwing at me some questions which will give me an indication of what things are bothering you, and let's proceed with our discussion along those lines. You started off. Fine. That's right, but you know, it's a funny thing, it's a funny thing that ha what happens in occupations that have all been women's occupations, and that is the minute the men start coming in, you watch the wage level go up. I'll give you an example. It's not just in office work where you get this, you get right through the professions too. You know, there are professions that are female professions. Social work, many years ago, was looked upon as do-good women's business. As a result, in the early years, it was a women's profession. I graduated from social work at a time when there were very few men who went into social work at all. And let me tell you, the wage levels in those days were in the bottom basement. That was an all-woman's profession, and it was an underpaid profession as a result. And then the men started moving in. And all of a sudden, you can look at the wage levels and watch it rising. Mind you, they took over the top jobs, too. Well, I blame us to a great extent for that. 
in teaching as well. I go after the teachers. The teachers allow them to take over all the principalships. That's another profession that used to be all female. I think that if you had secretarial services that were, and if I can use the word integrated, you'd begin to see a difference in the wage levels. But let's come back. Your real question was, how can the kind of law I'm talking about help women who are in secretarial work? If I were in secretarial work and had ambitions to get beyond that and step on, I would first of all get myself the necessary credential to apply for a job, let's say, in the administrative or managerial area. Because without the credential, you can't apply. I'd get myself, a, if I were a secretary, I would go to a SEGEP or wherever you go to get yourself some kind of a diploma in administration or management or something akin, and then apply for that opening when it came up. Now, if I've got that law and I've got my qualification, nobody can say to me I can't have that job because I'm a woman. I'm not going to worry about the secret, the empty vacancy of the secretaries. If the men don't come in and there aren't no, any secretaries, that's not going to make me weep. They'll start paying them well and they'll start getting men to go in. But your question's about how does this affect the woman, eh? You want the woman to get ahead. That's correct. Yeah. Shall I tell you that's not so in the federal service today? Shall I tell you it's not so in the federal service today? And there are special ju there are special courses now open for our secretaries. And if you're interested in getting details of it, I think maybe it might interest you. Write to the the Office of Equal Opportunity at the Public Service Commission. They've got series now of courses. We're trying to do precisely that. They're making us a great effort at this moment. How long it'll last, I don't know. But at this moment, there is a great effort being made to open doors for the secretarial people. And the only way you'll open a door is by getting that qualification. That There's no way out. You, there's no good saying to you, just apply for this job. Because if, if a man comes along with a certificate in his hand, you're not going to get the job because they're going to say he's better qualified. So you've got to qualify. Now, I don't know what the situation is locally, but all I can tell you is that there are efforts now being made to widen horizons. And the job that's being attempted by the Public Service Commission is one that's worth studying. I think we'll have to wait and see to what extent it does the job that it purports to be doing, but it's doing that job now. Yeah. Is Public Service Commission, uh, I think Ottawa will get them. I, I should think Public Service Commission Ottawa would get them. Office of Equal Opportunity. Ottawa. I, yeah, but Public Service Commission's a big place, too, you know. And if you're in Ottawa, which one of us doesn't know that commission? Yeah. No, I said I didn't know. I don't know. I don't know. Of, uh, the, the Quebec law is being revised. That I know. I know there are, beg your pardon? And um, in this problem, that's under provincial. I don't think that's illegal in this province. No, it's not. But it's not, it's not illegal in all of the provinces even that have the human rights law. It's perfectly legal to do in uh, British Columbia, for example, and they've got a very strong human rights law. So it differs. The pattern differs. I told you we're the most governed people on earth. We've got all kinds of laws. Uh,
Very difficult. Now let's talk a bit about that because that really is a tough one. That one really is very tough. Not only is it hard to prove, it's even hard to know. It's very difficult. My assessment of how I would do it if I were in charge of such a program is along the lines used by the Royal Commission on the Status of Women when they studied the differences in salaries paid to professors and assistant professors and lecturers at the universities. They did a big study because it was their impression that the women professors and others were all at a lower level than the male professors. Now, it was claimed by the universities to the Royal Commission that this wasn't because one was a man and one was a woman, but it was because of having greater academic achievement. You know, if you're a PhD, you earn more than if you're an MA. They claimed that it was because they had published more. That's a holy of holy in the academic world. The more you publish, the greater the, the longer your list of what you've done and the greater the experience. So they claimed. So the Royal Commission decided that, well, this may be, let's study it and see to what extent those things account for the difference in salary. And so they studied these factors. They studied the legitimate factors that might account for a difference. They looked to see what was the differences in their seniority level. How many MAs, how many PhDs, how much university study. They looked to see how many years experience, how many years did the man have, how many years did the woman have. They looked to see how much they had published, how much had the man published, how much. And having got all of these things calculated, there was still 40% that couldn't be accounted for. Ah, says the commission, that's the discrimination. I think you've got to do it by a series of examination of legitimate factors that might account for you not, let's say it's a promotion, and you don't get the promotion, and you claim it was discrimination, it was because you were a woman, and they claim no, it wasn't because you were a woman, it was because the man that got it was better qualified. My suggestion is to Study as well as you can, and you can't always do it very frequently. You can't even get a hold of the qualifications of the other fellow. He's not going to help you. He got the job. But to the extent that you're able to, examine those factors which might legitimately account for that difference. And if the, it doesn't wholly account for it, then there's no way out. It is discriminatory. You've got to do it in a negative way. I'll tell you another thing that's very difficult. Discrimination against women is a very different kind of discrimination than the other types that we know so well. Because if it's discrimination on grounds of color, then every person of that group recognizes discrimination for what it is. That every colored person, every black person knows what it means to be discriminated against because of color, because he's experienced it and he knows it. And the same goes for religious discrimination. Every member of every religious group understands if he's lived as a minority in a larger religious context, understands what it means to be discriminated against on account of his religion. But there are many, many women. I don't know whether it's half I can tell you that the number is large. There are many women who do not see it as discriminatory to discriminate against women. And so we've got a very peculiar and very difficult problem to cope with. 
because we've got not only to fight the discrimination, but we've got to raise the consciousness of these other women to understand what it means to be discriminated against. Remember, we're living in a society which has undergone a virtual social revolution. We still have living and in their middle years. And I'm sorry to say that I've even met them younger than their middle years who feel that it is a man's God-given duty to have a better position because he has on his shoulders greater responsibilities. They don't ask about women's responsibilities. They take the stereotype. And it is a very difficult, it's really almost not possible to change the mind of a woman who sees a woman's role as that traditional role and disregards the whole of the revolution, and, and I'm using that word advisedly because it is a revolution that's occurred in this generation. It's very difficult to get her to a point where she sees it. She hasn't felt it. If she lacks the sensitivity to understand the chores that fall on another woman, I can't say that I'll give her sensitivity, I can't make her sensitive. And the woman who is the inheritor of this traditional view and is herself comfortable, thank you, finds it very difficult to understand the position of a woman who jolly well isn't so comfortable and therefore doesn't see it as discriminatory when she gets a wage that's less than the man working next to her. So that to you, you started me on this by asking me, how do you tell discrimination? I can tell discrimination much more easily when it's on grounds of color, when it's on grounds of religion. It's jolly hard when it's on grounds of sex. But I think that we've, come a long way in the sense that we have at least sensitized the population. I don't know the situation here in Quebec very well, but I know that in many of our cities across the country, many of our larger cities, and I'm speaking particularly of a city like Toronto, which for size is comparable to Montreal, in a city like Toronto, if we haven't got the sympathy of everybody we want, sympathy meaning understanding, not, not uh, offering a shoulder to weep on. I don't want a shoulder to weep on. But we have achieved in a city like Toronto a sensitivity. They're very careful about what they say. And when they say it, they think they're saying it where they're not heard by those that are going to criticize them. At least that's an advance. We've reached a point now where some of the big companies in Toronto are looking for that token woman. Why? Not because they want to keep out all the rest of the women, but because they're going to look progressive. Hey, look, but this is sensitivity too. So I think we are achieving some move ahead. But to remove the discrimination on grounds of sex, you've also got to reteach attitudes of hundreds and hundreds of generations, and that will take time. Maybe in your day you'll see it. I doubt it. I think you'll see progress, but I don't think you'll see that kind of a world that all of us want to see where a human being is a human being, where a marriage is an equal partnership, where women are no longer second-class people. But it'll come, and you've got to work at it. Yeah.
Well, as I say, we're told that the, we haven't got our federal law yet, so, you know, I, I can't say. We're told it's going to be an independent body, and if, I, if that happens, then I've got to say that the next thing that it'll depend on is the kind of people who are chosen to administer it. Um, the attitude of the public, I think the attitude of the public is what will settle the kind of people that administer it. If you, the public, make clear to the government what kind of people you want to administer it, I think you'll get, uh, you'll go a long way. I want to tell you something. I don't know if you people appreciate the extent to which those whom we elect to Parliament read their mail. They read their mail and they keep a record of their mail and if they've had a lot of letters criticizing something or other or demanding something or other, I promise you they pay attention. So that I think it's in the last analysis, it's up to us what kind of a law it is. And I think in the last analysis, it's up to us how it's administered. Big pardon? Well, we're promised at this session of Parliament. I'm not a politician, I'm just a lowly bureaucrat, and I have to accept what I'm told. The public has been told by the Minister of Justice that in this session of Parliament he hopes to introduce it. I know that there's something coming or already on its way, I believe, in Quebec. Is there? I don't know. Yes, I haven't had an opportunity to study that one yet. Yes. Well, Mr. Lalonde said publicly about uh, four weeks ago, he's the minister responsible for the status of women, for the implementation of the recommendations of the Royal Commission report. And what he said was this, and I can only repeat it. He said that when the government is satisfied as to a clear point of view amongst the public, that regardless of his personal views, he will adhere to public opinion. There's your answer. I, ta I tell you again, I believe ministers do listen to the public. You've got to make your point of view known. And uh, if you have a preponderance of the people wanting something, you'll get it. If it's split down the middle, I don't know. I can't answer what will happen then. I don't know. I'm not a politician. Yeah. Yes, um, well, let me start off by saying that um, I do not like protective legislation. Um, I've said this publicly before. Um, I don't like legislation that tells women how they should uh, guard themselves unless it's from something that's not visible. Um, I can understand you telling a woman who's pregnant not to work in radiation. That I understand because radiation has a very serious effect on a fetus. So that I understand. Now, if you're asking me though about such things as working down the mine, or working in factories where the kind of thing I mentioned with radiation doesn't apply, I do not like that kind of protective legislation. Is there such, are there such laws? Um, there are laws about mining uh, which conform to a very old international covenant of the ILO. And I can only tell you here that a group of us at the ILO are trying to get that one changed there. And probably that will have an effect 
on national legislation eventually. In this province, though, and here I, uh, I would draw your attention to one of your laws, and unless it's been amended, it's very restrictive, and it's more restrictive than any law in the rest of Canada. Um, I'll give you its name. The uh, Industrial and Commercial Establishments Act, is very, very limiting in its freedom of choice for women in certain kinds of industries. You, the people of Quebec, are the ones that should attend to that, though. But in principle, um, the effect of protective legislation is to discriminate against women in opportunities of employment laws which prohibit her from working at night do not then give her equal opportunity for employment because an employer is then asked to take a woman and then not be free to have her on employment when he needs her. Um, the only protective legislation that I can see as essential is the kind I mentioned with regard to radiation in certain circumstances. I don't even like the kind of legislation which prescribes the weight that a man may lift and the weight that a woman may lift. We have a law federally which is worded this way, that no worker, that goes for male and female, no worker shall be required to lift a weight likely to prejudice health and well-being, period. Now, the reason for that is very simple. We've extended the protection to male workers because in the old days they would say a man can lift a weight of 60 pounds and a woman can lift a weight of 35 pounds. If the man happened to be suffering from a hernia and he lifted that 60-pound weight, he'd be done in. And the wording of the law as we have it now is he cannot be required to lift that weight. So we've extended, by doing away with this special protection for women, we've extended the protection to all workers. And this, I think, is what we should do with protective legislation. If the mines are so bad that the women can't work down them, then maybe the men shouldn't be there. And if they're not so bad for the men to be there, then the woman should be free to choose. I don't know why she would, but she should be free to go if she wants to. Yeah. It's really only beginning to roll now. We amended it about two years ago. Up until then, it was in the same status as the provincial laws. It really wasn't operating. It really wasn't. But recently, they've been going after, as I told you, they're going, there's one large firm, I don't want to mention names here because this, is, uh, this wouldn't be uh, exactly the most ethical thing for me to do, but uh, if it lands in the law courts, you'll know the name. And it might land in the law courts. But all I can tell you at this moment is that our own inspectors are going through that place with a fine comb under equal pay legislation. Uh, I haven't got the score, but we've had a few cases, but at least it's really now only beginning. It's really in its early stages. But I think it's capable of being implemented, and I will say this, I think that there is now a, a, a climate which is right for implementation, and perhaps that, wasn't, uh, perhaps that wasn't there years ago when they first brought in the law. At any rate, it's beginning now to roll. Yeah.
Well, that's the Department of Manpower. Um, training, counseling, placement is the Department of Manpower. The Department of Labor, and I'm speaking now only of the federal department, eh? We've got to get our, we've got to get our government straight because, you know, you have a Department of Labor provincially. The Federal Department of Manpower is the department that does the training, that runs the Manpower Centers for Employment, that does the counseling. That's all in another department. The Department of Labor federally, I suppose our most important function is in the field of industrial relations. I don't need to tell you about all the strikes. You hear about them here and you feel them here. Uh, the post office the uh, longshoremen, all of these industries are under federal jurisdiction. A longshoreman's strike in Montreal means that the officers of the Federal Department of Labor are on the job. Then there is a sub another section, that's called the industrial relations section. Then there is the section called labor standards, and this is what I was speaking about when I mentioned the labor code. They're the people that are doing the investigation in connection with equal pay. They're the people that enforce the laws pertaining to maternity leave. Uh, that's for those undertakings that come within the area of federal jurisdiction, that section of the Federal Department of Labor is responsible. How it goes through the courts, though, is a different matter. What happens is that the complaint is made to the Department of Labor, which investigates it. If there is a case there, it's then shipped to the Department of Justice. Let me give you an example of something that's happening now, because I'm sure a lot of you have heard about it. According to the Labor Code, you may not fire a worker due solely to pregnancy. Now, an airline in Western Canada decided, having spent years building up their stewardesses as sweet little sex symbols, in a very embarrassing position because they have to keep them on after they're pregnant, which rather spoils that nice little symbolism that they had built up over the years. And as a result, they fired them. Well, we're taking them to court. We're taking them to court, not directly through us, but we have recommended to the Department of Justice, which is the arm of the federal government which does this kind of work before the courts. And the Department of Justice is proceeding with that case in the courts at this time. That's how it operates. Uh, this is really technical law which doesn't have to concern you too much. It would, the way it would affect you personally, your contact would be with an inspector of the Department of Labor. If you were that stewardess, you're, you would be talking to the Department of Labor officials in the Labor Standards Branch who are responsible for the implementation. I'm just explaining what happens afterwards when it comes to a point of bringing it to the courts. Then what we do is we write to justice and justice has to institute the proceedings. Um, there are many other things the Department of Labor does, but by and large, those two areas are our main areas. The Women's Bureau is a part of the Labor Standards Branch, but I don't implement legislation. I don't administer law. I prefer not to administer law, because if I administered law, I'm stuck down in this little area of federal jurisdiction. I talk ideas, and I tell you there are no boundaries to ideas, so I talk right across the board. But um, I believe it's a similar setup in this province. I'm not sure. You would have to find out from uh, Quebec City if that's the procedure. But then, as I say, they, they don't have uh, the same kind of law. The one law I mentioned for Quebec, the 1964 law, is administered in this province by the Minimum Wage Commission. So it's an entirely different setup. 
I think we've about run dry, have we? Right. Well, daycare, of course, is provincial. The federal government has made available a lot of money for the provinces. I don't know if the provinces are using it, and I don't know whether you even knew it, but uh, the amount last year was $8 million. I don't know how much of it Quebec is using. But there are funds available federally, but the federal government cannot get into this area. This is the welfare area of, that belongs to the provinces. Um, but you asked me something else besides daycare. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, the mythology. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I've learned with, I, I handle that mythology. I handle a whole lot of them the same way. When they start telling me that women are nervous and they can't, uh, you know, and women are sick and they're always fainting and women will get married and go home and have their babies, all I say is show me. Where are your figures? Where are your statistics? How many have you tried? I've got statistics that don't show that. I think if you make them put up, you know, these, these are the, all a part of the old stereotype. The Victorian lady that's always fainting. You know, it's, what always amazes me is when they come up with the, the nervous end of it, eh? they say that mm, the, the, the job of a woman is to stay home and bring up her kids. Well, if she's such a nervous wreck, I don't know how in the world they're allowing their kids to be brought up by her. But the fact is, there are some nervous women. And by gad, there are also some nervous men, eh? And there are some very stable women, and there are some very stable men, and people come in all shapes and all forms. And if they're going to tell me women are more so, show me. There's no scientific evidence that I've seen. I'll accept it if they show me. No one's been able to so far. With regard to the claim that they get married and leave the labor force, we've done a big study with the uh, women employed by the federal government because that's about the largest employer of women in Canada. And we found this kind of a picture that in the dull jobs, in the boring jobs, this still happens, although less than it used to, but it still happens. But as the level of interest and level of professionalism rises, there's a greater and greater attachment to the labor force to such an extent that the number of women leaving on marriage at the second or third level is almost nil now. The pattern is changing very, very rapidly. Fewer and fewer women are permanently, or even for a period of 10 years or 12 years, doing what they did only 10 years ago. 10 years ago, there was this double, double career of women. That's disappearing now. With regard to the dull jobs, I don't know. The question of not training, this, the, the story, I won't train them because they will, I say, you give me the data on which you base this statement. The banks used to give us that. They weren't allowing women in the early, well, the early years. Up to five years ago, I don't think there were any women on any of their, in, their training programs. And the reason was, this was the reason they gave one will invest money in their training and they'll leave us as soon as they get married. Two, they're not mobile, they, they can't be transferred from place to place. I said, just show me your data. There wasn't any, because they'd never, they'd never offered. Well, they're offering women the training now. Well, as I say, when, 
once they have children, we're finding when, they, when the work they're doing is not of the routine, boring type that they're going back. This is why there's such a tremendous demand now for facilities, public facilities, to look after younger children. Sure, sure. I think that's coming. I don't know what, how advanced they are here. But I don't view daycare centers as parking lots for children so that women can go to work. I view daycare centers as essential community services for the good of the children. You know, I, I take that, incidentally, it also provides this other uh, service, if you want to call it that. It frees women not only to work, it frees them to expand their knowledge, it, exp it, it permits them to have greater creativity, but these aren't my main reasons for furthering daycare facilities in the public area. My main reason is that I've been very impressed with people that know better than I do about child training and child care. And their assessment is that we waste those early years of a child's life and that they're the most absorptive years. And that in fact, if we don't start giving them the kind of training that we do when they go to school at six, we've wasted at least four years of great absorptive capacity of the human child. And uh, that really is what has impressed me even more. But it will have this other effect. Big Ben? That's right, that's right. We've got to convince women too, my friend. That's right. Well, they, they make us, they try to make us feel guilty about it. I think we've got to cope with that too. Yeah. any type of educational uh, facilities that would uh, attempt to get women educated so that they could take on different kinds of jobs or that they're motivated to take Well, I do a lot of propaganda, but education is a very holy, holy field. It's strictly provincial. If you can call the kind of talks I give as educational, and maybe they are that, then that's it. Um, but in the education system proper, we do not uh, have any opportunity to uh, have any input at all. I think we've uh, run them ragged. All right, one more here. She hasn't asked one yet. Mr. Yeah. if you sure. just let, uh, yeah. we have a representative from the Department of uh, uh, Guidance to thank you. Oh, officially. good. Oh, that's very kind. Of. Mm -hmm. Get out of the way. You didn't even use that. Huh? No, I didn't. I, don't know much I, like, I, like I won't use it either. Well, in a few short words, in the name of this fine group, I'd like to say thank you to Mrs. Gilbert. Uh, thank you also to Ms. Gil Kisson for organizing this uh, little affair. Uh, as I was listening to Mrs. Gilbert, uh, few things came to my mind. Uh, first of all, I was thinking that in a court of justice, you'll never win a case because they will tell you ignorance of the law excuses no one. Now what about if there's no laws or regulations? I guess this would be a pretty difficult situation for the judge. I hope that the message that Ms. Gilbert was trying to put through is that if there is no laws or regulation to protect the women in Quebec, I think you must act. And on the other hand, I had a feeling that some laws that are existing it seems to be working against you women, like the protective laws she was mentioning. It's probably time that those laws and regulations and so forth are changed. Us men can't do it. We probably won't ask. We may think that women are invading our world, we can't say that we have private clubs like before, mentioning taverns. Now they're like, almost like in England, pubs. 
Of course, there's always there always be a world where men won't invade from women. She has mentioned a few things about it. But you get you get laws and regulations that is not protecting you in that particular field. Again, because it's not only a woman's year, but I should say woman's world nowadays, you should start acting now. And she gave you a few hints on how to go about complaining if you feel that you're uh, not well served, either through salaries, working conditions, I think you know what you do, what you should do. For your information, you'd be surprised maybe to learn that when she mentioned different large companies, especially crown companies, uh, CNR, for instance, now have on its staff at least two brakemen or brake women. They're not too sure how they're going to call them yet. Uh, at least two trainmen or train women again. Used to be porters, now they use another term. They have also a woman as lift truck operator. That means she works in the yard with this huge uh, lift truck there, where normally it used to be a big husky fellow. I've seen the woman who was working that. She's a woman. She might be husky, but she's still a woman, and she's doing a very good job. But it brings me to the point that besides having to fight for uh, trying to convince the employer, he's normally a man, that you can do that job, don't forget there's a union there. And if you know something about the CNR union, they're very strong. So that's another point that you girls, women, have to fight. Again, Ms. Gilbert, thanks a lot. Time is running short. And pleasure was ours. And quite welcome. Just before you all leave, I'd like to remind you that uh, we have a reception afterwards, and I invite you also, Mr. Grail, because I'm sure that uh, for those of us who are at Sir George, perhaps you're all going to be interested in asking him questions as to what kind of jobs he encourages the women students to take after they graduate. <laughs> all right? And uh, Ms. Galver, I hope you'll, you'll be there, and you'll all have an occasion to uh, pose your questions and continue, because I think a lot of things have been raised that perhaps bear a further uh, discussion. It's on the seventh floor, everyone knows, all right? Women's Lounge.